Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Living Wholehearted Podcast. We are Jeff and Tara Matson, a husband and wife team who is shrinking the integrity gap in our own lives and helping others do the same. I'm a leadership and organizational development coach, and Tara is a licensed marriage and family therapist. We believe that if you have a following, you are a leader and how you lead matters. Whether you are leading in the home, work, or community, we are bringing you biblical, clinical, and relational wisdom to help you in every relationship that matters most to you. None of us do this perfectly, but we are leaning into the reality of our humanity and profound wisdom of grace. to have Monty and Stephanie Schmidt with us today. They've been married 31 years and have five children. Stephanie has been a stay-at-home mom for 25 years, and Monty's got quite a vast history with leadership. He was a high school teacher, a coach. He's been a vice president of a company for 10 years. He's been a pastor, and now he's a counselor with us at Living Wholehearted for the last three years. Stephanie's experience includes learning to parent adopted kids with disabilities and mentoring many women and moms over the years and has become a kitsuchi artist. I'm going to need you to unpack that. Did I just me- did I just mess that up? It's so close. <laughs> You're okay. really close. How, how do you say that? Kintsugi. Ah, Kintsugi artist. Kintsugi. So Monty, he was adopted at birth and has a global and cultural ministry passion. Uh, he's a depression survivor and has a heart for wounded leaders. And so today we're going to talk about the journey of running a long marathon of leadership and just how you make it through the hardships of life and marriage and serving others. And it is like a marathon. And ironically, Monty and I trained for our one and only marathon (laughs) back in the day in 2001. That was the beginning of our relationship back when we all started ministry together. And so that's just a fun memory. And really applies to where we are even today. I think we're in like, what, mile 17 of the life of ministry here? Yeah. 26.2. So so (laughs) welcome, Monty and Stephanie. We're really glad to have you guys. Thank you. All right. Well, Monty, let's start with you. So tell us a little bit about life story, background. We'll get to some of the leadership stuff, but just tell us a little bit about you. And uh, we'd like to hear our audience loves to get to know our our guests and uh, tell us a little bit about life and life as a uh, growing up and uh, in your experiences. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, again, on behalf of Steph and I, we're just so pleased to be here. Lifelong friends and journeying together, uh, marathons, both <laughs> literally and figuratively. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as uh, as our bio says, we're, we're not we're certainly not uh, pups anymore. Um, my lovely bride and I, we have lots of stars and scars together, as we like to say. And uh after 31 years of marriage, raising five kids, we're in a chapter of life right now that I think that we're just trying to put together all of those puzzle pieces that have taken place. And at the time, we were in them, but we didn't fully understand all of them. We really didn't. And so um, our chapter of life right now is just really um, trying to still absorb that, but then hopefully then just sharing that in a variety of different ways in life with just all the people that God is bringing to us. Stephanie, what about you? Anything you want to add to the stage of life you're in and the and a bit of the journey you've been on? Well, I would say in a lot of ways, it's just, it feels so much easier than some of the places that we've been. And I feel like God has allowed us to be in a place that we're able to take the things that we've experienced and really hurt through, but also healed through and put it into practice and, and just continue... Um, Growing in our relationship with the Lord, growing in our in our knowledge of uh, our own hearts and each other's hearts, and then um, we still have two girls at home. Our two daughters are still at home, and just putting it into practice as we continue raising them, and then parenting adult children. And you got four boys, right? Three. three. Wait, three boys. Yeah, That's yeah. right. Yep. That's right. Three <laughs> three sons who are all grown, and then yeah. our daughters um, came to us via uh, South Korea and China. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So five total. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to uh, Jared, Joel, and Alex. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Our, our yep. That's, That's, right. Right. That's right. Tell us a little bit about that journey of choosing to do adoption um, after having your three sons. I'm curious about that. Yeah. Well, Monty was adopted from the Portland area, and so even when we were dating, we we decided that adoption was important to both of us, and we weren't sure what that would look like uh, once we got married, and you know, would we have biological children and adopt or just adopt, or we weren't really sure, but we knew that we wanted that to be part of our story. And so we had the three boys, and thought that probably adoption would be something that would be later on. And when the boys were, oh, in the probably like three three to six range, they're pretty close in age, and they started asking if we could have more kids. (laughs) And so we told them about adoption, and they started praying about it. And that was really important for us because we knew that we didn't want it to be something that we just decided to do, but we wanted to do it as a family. And the boys being a part of that was really important to us. Yeah. In fact, uh, one other, I think, little factoid with that is that, you know, we being adopted, I, I think I just always had this intuitive sense that it would be good to pay that forward, so to speak. In fact, we talked about it when we were either engaged or dating. We can't remember which it was. It was a um, long yeah. time ago. <laughs> but even with all of that, um, you know, to Steph's point, we did want it to be something that we did just as a family. We did. We, we just really were trying to do our best to pay attention to not just ask our boys to come along for this ride. Well, the reality is, as Steph said, is that um, it's so the simplicity of children. We we were still praying through all of the practicalities of what would this be like and what would it do to our family, all of these things. And the boys were kind of like, what are we waiting for? <laughs> I mean, can I, you know, and so in, in essence, they were really important to us in making the journey. And it, and it needed to be important because once we brought our daughters home that we loved so, so much, there were all these things that had to be done in us ahead of time because we just really at that point had no idea what we were going to face. Yeah, needs. and the, Yeah, the, just... I could see those three boys. When I, we first met you all, you, you were being commissioned at, at, at our church. And I can remember, I see, I see those three boys and that they're so, that when they were that young and just remember smiling, thinking, man, that, that household, that's a busy household right there, three boys. Mm-hmm. There. Yes. And, uh, and then to see you guys uh, bring your girls into the picture, that's mm. special. And now those fellas, uh, I, I, I see them now. And Alec, Alex is taller than me. Yeah. yeah he's <laughs> a big six foot. I'm not sure. <laughs> <a big> <laughs> so, Oh, it's Love like it. a well, I hear you both kind of alluding to again a lot of the heart in the journey. You know, we often tell mm. the end of the story, and so what I love about the seasoned life you've lived is you've got a lot of reality and and some things that you can tell us um, now and as you look back. And so, talk about uh, there was a season in your journey along the way that just felt like a really low point. Let's talk about that because that is so common, and even in this last year uh, with 2020, it's it really is causing lots of people to really rethink a lot of their life and their priorities. And so tell us more about that journey. Yeah. Well, I'll just dive right in. You know, even even as you shared my bio, there, there's, there's already this theme of going from, gosh, teacher to then in the corporate world and then back to ministry, now to counseling. And that's a pretty significant theme, and it relates to this real, real low point, um, which came about about halfway through my ministry experience. But it was when I say that, that was sort of the, um, as I like to say, and I didn't coin this language, many have used it, where, where I hit my wall. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it was a real, real low point. And, 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 and I think the way that I at least begin to describe it to everyone is that... Um, Part of it was um, the reality of entering into life adopted. Even though I I was very well loved and cared for, a very imperfect but very loving home, you know, I I started to form something in me early on that I didn't understand and didn't recognize. And then as I got older, it just kind of codified. It got deeper and deeper. So I'm I'm going through life trying to manage life. Now I, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have necessarily put it that way back earlier years, 
but but I can see it now that it was. It was my life became about management because there was something very scary within me that I didn't understand, and so it had to be hidden at all cost. Well, in in my journey and in and our journey as a couple, as in a family, I just happened to hit that segment, though, where I, I learned some complex coping skills as a leader and found out that hiding in plain sight, I could do very well. Hmm. It was almost like a chameleon-esque. Um, part of it was people-pleasing. Part of it was I knew how to use manipulation skills. Um, not that I meant them to be evil, but they really were. I was I knew how to move myself in situations. And you know, there you go back in, in the in the education world, in the corporate world, ministry, nonprofit. Man, those th- those are actually sought after skills many times. All of that was going on and looking really good, I think, to most people on the outside, including my wonderful wife that's sitting here next to me now. The problem was that they were all mechanisms, ways of me to cope with. Uh, in this this duality in my mind, one, it was self-protection, right? I was really trying to be the person that I thought other people needed me to be and that I actually wanted to be. But But even lurking deeper than that was this deep sense that I have no idea who I am. Mm. I have no idea who I am and I've got to keep doing these things that I think makes sense, that are aligned with my value system, even the depth of my faith. And so it led to this, this deeply embedded mindset is that I'll finally get there one day. Keep going and I'll finally get there. But now to address that question that you asked, Tara, like well, what, 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 what was it? What was this dark period? It was, yeah, at this time, there was a, a whole series of challenging circumstances they came into my life. I would say now they were brought into my life. Thank you, God. But it began to challenge all of those coping behaviors, all of those checks and balances, and it scared me to death. But what made it even harder is that everybody in my life at the time said, oh, you should do this. It was a high-level leadership position. You'll be great at it. But really what this did, it forced me out of what I'd call my safer green zone into a place, but I couldn't stay there long. And all of a sudden, all of those coping strategies began to, um, they just kind of wilted. They just started to, to just, they, they, they just, they couldn't, they didn't, weren't serving me well, which meant I had to take more and more of my time to protect, which um, Steph will talk about here in just a, a few minutes. But ultimately, I just began to close down more and more of my min- my um, energy was just to keep things looking good on the outside. But deep down, I knew, I knew they were failing and I was terrified. But at that point, you know, that had to be protected kind of at all costs at that point, which ultimately led to just very, very deep clinical depression. And ultimately, I had to step down from the role and go into a deep season of healing that I think will we'll probably talk about just, you know, a little bit later in the recording. Really significant. And I know there's people listening that are going, uh, he's talking about me or I know. That sounds this familiar. Is very familiar. Yeah. And again, those maladaptive coping strategies that served us well through the wounds of our younger years start to leak at some point. So talk more, Stephanie, about what that was like for you as this is all starting to build. As it was building, so before he got to the point that we we said, this is depression and he had to take a leave, as it was building, I didn't know and I didn't really understand what was going on on the inside. I didn't understand you know, what he was telling himself or what he was believing on the inside. And so I just saw less of him, um, more sleep, working more. And then when he was home, I felt like he wasn't completely there. And I remember being Mm -hmm. frustrated because I felt like, I felt like work was getting the best part of him. And then when he got home, there just wasn't anything left. And I was, I was, so that was frustrating, but it also scared me because I felt like he was going to burn out and not knowing a lot about his just family health history because he was adopted. 
I was afraid he was going to have a heart attack or something big was going to happen that was going to completely sideline him, which meant it was going to sideline all of us because we all really depended on him. We're a close-knit family, and he's a really important role. He plays a really important role for all of us in our lives and in our hearts, and that would have been a really devastating thing to just have him completely taken out and have no control. So that was a really hard, scary time. Mm, yeah. Which if I can jump in, I would say I felt that. I mean, I was already feeling so much, but then I felt that from Steph. I felt that from a couple of people who I wasn't letting them in. So they didn't know, as she said, I just really, at that point in my journey, I couldn't let anybody in at that level. But, but just to just to kind of piggyback on what she said though, but see that that actually made it worse because that was that was just kind of an echo chamber for that voice. You're failing, you're letting people down. And for my whole life, I just tried harder. And um, but now the the excruciating pain was coming like, I don't know how to try harder now. And it's like the the harder I try, the worse it is getting. Yeah, and coming to the, I, you guys are setting the table up so well in terms of just the pressure cooker that exists in that scenario and not knowing what to do, not knowing how to support, but yet the roles being so important uh, to, um, as a family, uh, in, in providing, uh, all of these things were mounting. And it, 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 the intensity, the energy was going for you, Monty, you, you're describing that the energy, so much of it was going into keeping up appearance. And uh, at all costs, I heard you say multiple mm -hmm. times now, and that feeling, um, people can relate to that feeling because as leaders, and this is something that we've noticed over a long period of time, as the risk or as the costs increase, the uh, temptation and the, almost the urgency to um, keeping it together increases as well. And, and as role and influence and authority, and it, it's, it's a snowball. And you're not alone. And it's uh, thank you for sharing just what it was feeling like. Tell us more about what you were thinking was at cost when you say yeah. at all costs I'm going to hide. What were mm -hmm. you thinking were the costs? I mean, play that out yeah. for us. Yeah, I, I, I would. You know, I'm, I'm now taking myself back into what was really going on within me. And again, I, I like to use this language because I think it is for me. But I think this is very common is that, that there was this scared little boy. There was this scared little boy who had missed things growing up. And, and some of it was not to, I, I'm not a fan of all the bashing on family or, all, but, I, but I do believe we live in a world where brokenness is everywhere. And I don't think it's possible for any adult to come out of that unscathed. I do think I had a couple particular challenges that were unique to me. But, but in answering that question, Tara, it was, it had been a lifelong journey to essentially find myself. And even though I knew I was not at all where I wanted to be, what was not missing is I knew what I most wanted. I knew what I most believed. I knew my relationship with Jesus was real. I knew how much I loved my wife and my kids. I knew how I really wanted to serve the body of Christ. And I knew what I wanted but that image is what had to be protected. There was a disconnect there. It wasn't all one side or the other. It was the and both. I knew what I was going for, but I knew there was a gap. And I just did not feel at that time that I could let that all down and just say, I'm a very broken person. I, I did not have the capacity to say, I know what I believe. I just don't know how to get there but I've been rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, as some would say, as a metaphor. It's like, if it gives me something to do, but I knew that the iceberg was coming. And so that's what terrified me is that, that, that all that stuff that I had been living for would be exposed. Even the stuff that I said, well, I don't want to give that away. I just want it to be real. And so when the circumstances brought you to that place where it, it, you didn't have any control o o over the, it, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Did, what did you feel? Was there any freedom in that in some respect? Great or? question, Jeff. Yeah. And this is, you know, and, and this is where I will say rightfully so. I mean, everybody will, you know, everybody's story is different. I'm not going to try to paint a picture that everybody has to go through the sort of thing I went through. I don't, I don't believe that at all. 
But what I would say, Jeff, for my journey is that it was it was actually I, I understand how important necessary it was for me to run out of options. Okay, to run out right. of options. Those those coping mechanisms, or what I, I I didn't come up with this. A wise person said this. I like to give them credit, but I don't know who it is. Is that I'd adopted such embedded trust structures that they had to be disassembled. Mm. So the way that God had to do that in my life is he literally didn't give me like a cane to prop me up. He took me out and put me on a gurney. Mm. So in, in mine, I mean, the, the, the depression went from just kind of emotional roller coaster to I finally literally fried out my adrenal system, which, which manages brain chemistry. So I, I kind of went into, you know, I went into full mental illness. I, I could not process that way, which meant then I couldn't do my job. And I found myself sitting in front of a gifted counselor and a gifted doctor that this is what they did. And they said, you need full-time medical leave now, which then led to a multi-month period where I did, I literally had to step down off my job and move into a period of healing. But it was months and months. It was, it was, it was an excruciating time. So the first part of it was I literally had to be taken out. Mm-hmm. I, I wish I could say, oh, I chose to take I, – I saw it. I did it. Not my story. You know, praise God for people who can do that. I literally had to be carried out on the gurney. And then for months from, you know, pretty intense therapy and just godly people coming in uh, to get to the place where I could even stabilize. But but one other thing I will say just uh, on this note, though, is that even though it would take another period of time before I could kind of see more clearly, what happened immediately when that happened was that some of the things that I most feared didn't come about. Step didn't leave me, right? Yes. And the the people that I worked with and worked for, that I, I had it really built up in my mind, I can't do it, so I'll be fired in disgrace. I'll just have to go. I mean, I had it all cooked up in my mind. But but they, through the elders of our church and other pastors, good friends, they just came in and just said, oh, my gosh, we had no idea. Mm. Let us bear your burdens. Mm. And so I think that was an important part of a ray of hope, even though it was just the beginning of deconstructing some of those very vast and complex trust structures, like I call them, before I could actually really get into any sense of healing. Thank you for that honesty. And uh, Stephanie, you know, just take us to your heart and thoughts and processing as in that time, as you recall, and what Monty just shared, what what was going on for you and for your family uh, in that journey? Well, interestingly, God gave me a lot of peace. Once we figured out what it was, it was I was so relieved that we were getting the help that I knew we needed. I didn't know what help we needed, but I knew we needed something. I knew that we that we couldn't keep going on the trajectory that we were on and and do well. And so that was really wonderful news for me, getting a really gifted counselor who we both trusted and a doctor who came highly recommended to me. I just felt like, oh, this is this is yeah, exactly th- what we need. This is what it is that we're facing, and they, yes. and, and you guys know what to do, and you'll teach us. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a relief. Yes. I typically battle anxiety, and so that's one of the reasons I know during this time it was just a really, just a huge gift that God gave me that I wasn't anxious. I had peace about it, and I didn't know what it was going to look like, but I just knew it was going to be okay. In fact, I even remember the day we sat down with um, the kids, really the boys were old enough to understand. They were all in high school at the time and explaining it to them. And one of the boys looked at me and said, well, mom, how do you feel? And I said, it's going to be okay. I really believe it's going to be okay. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how long it's going to be, but God gave me the peace to know that it was going to be okay. But part of it too was really trusting and feeling like we were in wonderful, capable hands. Well, several things as we conclude part one that I'm hearing that I just want to draw out is some of our journeys come to a screeching halt when we (laughs) run out of options. I think about our training and our marathon training, and all I wanted to do was to finish that marathon. I didn't care what the time was. 
And I think about how, what happened after, and I use that in the book, Shrinking the Integrity Gap, that analogy of all the training that we did that prepared me for the marathon. And I actually didn't feel the injuries that I thought maybe I would feel. In fact, I was ready to go run another one. I was really surprised I didn't. And I just remember the little things like the crowds on the sides that God would bring to just cheer me on. And when I was feeling like I was going to hit my wall, which they said at mile 17, you would hit your wall. And I didn't because there were people there cheering us on. I remember seeing Jeff and I remember seeing signs and I remember being handed gummy bears and bananas. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of people falling off on the sides and, and not finishing the race. And and then there's some of us that, you know, run it and finish it, and there's injuries along the way. But we, and I remember the last two miles of that marathon, for me, I had a friend who came and joined me and finished the race with me. And there's all these pieces that I'm hearing in your story that are so vital to be able to finish the race, because here you are, you're still in the race, Monty. And so let's talk about that more in our next uh, week uh, so definitely come back because I know you want to hear how, how what happened. Like, how did Monty and Stephanie move through this? And how can you, as a leader, run your race well, regardless of where you are, whether you're starting out and you're training or you are at mile 17 in a 26.2 mile race? Well, in our podcast, you know us by now that we're about helping leaders with live with integrity, and we're trying to do that in our own lives, and it's a it's an everyday lifestyle rhythm of choices that we make. And uh, you know, uh, we've written uh, Shrinking the Integrity Gap together, Tara and I, our first co-authored offering, and it speaks to that, um, not only from our lives, but the clinical, the biblical, and relational wisdom. Uh, it's available everywhere. Um, you can purchase books. And we hope that you will join us in the movement to help shrink our integrity gaps. This podcast is powered by Living Wholehearted, Courageous Girls, and the Christian Parenting Podcast Network. Thank you for joining us in this critical movement of shrinking our integrity gaps between what we preach and live.